Well, we're delighted that so many people can gather with us uh, this evening, and I promise you, you're in for a very special treat. Uh, I've, Cardinal Maradiaga has been with us for the past few days here on campus, and uh, he's just an extraordinary human being. Uh, and as we would say in an, a, a Celtic aphorism, the real, the real shilling, I mean, uh, the genuine article by way of, of what we expect from a a great prince of the church. And it's my privilege to introduce him. Let me say just a quick word. My name is Thomas Groom, for those of you who haven't uh, met yet. God bless you. And I always say, God bless you. Don't just say, bless you. I mean, why have we banished God, God talk from the public realm? So, and, and in some ways, you know, theologically, we're not entitled to bless anybody, but we can ask God to bless somebody. So always say, God bless you. Okay, that's my fervorino for the day. And God bless everybody who sneezes hereafter, okay? So we don't have to pause. And, and, and do it individually. Um, I serve, I have the pr privilege, honor of serving, uh, currently serving as the director for the Church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. And I think one of the best programs we do is this program of bringing in Episcopal visitors. And we find significant leadership people in the Episcopacy, and we invite them to come to Boston College and to get acquainted with us, to get to know us, to spend some time with our theology faculty, with our students, and of course then to give a public lecture as well. It's been a marvelous program, and I think none more successful than this particular one. Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga, he's the Archbishop of Tegucigalpa uh, in Honduras. He's a Salesian, and I want to mention that because I'm a Salesian old boy, and it was the Salesians that gave me my love of teaching. Um, the Jesuits tried to make me a theologian. They didn't succeed nearly as success. They were nearly as successful. Uh, so he's a Salesian, the son of Don Bosco. Uh, he's a former president of Caritas Internationalis, former president of the Latin American Episcopal Conference, CELAM, which has been such a source of, of life and hope and new perspective uh, for the whole church, not just for the, for the Church of Latin America. He was born to Gushigalpa, the third of four children. Uh, as a young man, he wanted to be a saxophone player in a band. And uh, uh, his mother had other ideas, and he became a classical pianist. Uh, and then God had other ideas as well, and he became a Salesian. So between God and his mom, uh, which are often synonymous, I found in my life, <laughs> uh, he became a wonderful Salesian, but is still a classical uh, pianist. Um, besides dual doctorates in philosophy and theology uh, from the Silesianum and the, the Lateran in Rome, he has a background in psychology, in psychotherapy, in chemistry, in physics, and he's taught all of those. So like any Silesian, he knows he can teach whatever needs to be taught. And in many ways taught for many years, then became named a bishop, and in 2001, Pope John Paul II named him the first cardinal to be named from Honduras. At the Vatican, he has served in many different capacities. He's been a member of the Congregation for Catholic Education since 2012. But I suppose his most important function of late is his friendship, partnership, collaboration with Pope Francis. He serves as coordinator of the Council of Cardinals that Pope Francis put in place to help him reform the Vatican. Uh, keep them in your prayers, keep in your, in your prayers. Uh, they'll need God's help, God knows. Um, and he's been a key advisor on, in that role. So it's a wonderful privilege to have him here. This evening he's going to talk to us about international solidarity in the age of Pope Francis. Would you please welcome Bishop Cardinal Rodriguez Maradiaga. Thank you so much. Let me tell you how happy I feel to be here, because in first place, I have to greet my comforter, Bishop Maros Muldoon, who was a missionary in Honduras for how many years? 47 years missionary in Central America, most of his time in Honduras, and uh, um, emeritus bishop from Juticalpa in the department of Olancho. Thank you. I want to greet as well Father Jim Ronan, an old friend of the St. James Society who also was a great missionary 
and especially when he was working with the Bishops' Conference of the United States, he was helping a lot to Central America, to Honduras, and to all, and greeting all of you. It's, uh, I am not going just to give a lecture. I would like to have a conversation with you about this interesting theme of solidarity in the age of Pope Francis. Before the 80s, the issue of solidarity was hardly considered in much of the world. Occasionally, in cases of tragedies or natural disasters, appeals to solidarity were made for the purpose of aid. But in the shipyards of Gdansk, Poland, a group of labor unions founded a union that received the name Solidarność, and everything changed. The rest is history. Soon after, in John Paul II's encyclical Centesimus Annus, solidarity received its letter of citizenship in the social doctrine of the church. In these brief reflections, I will try to respond to the subject that I have been asked to discuss, international solidarity in the age of Pope Francis. First of all, I have to say that solidarity is very timely. Pope Francis has consistently spoken about the subject of solidarity during the most recent humanitarian crisis. He was reminded us that solidarity is the real solution to the most serious problems in the world. He has reiterated to us that the social achievements of the most developed countries are born precisely of solidarity, which in the turn emerged from Christian principles. The structural sin of secularized materialistic and indifferent society has obscured pillars of this country's achievements and has thrown them into crisis. Let us briefly look at a few examples. The European Union threatened with self-destruction just looked to Spain, to Great Britain with Brexit, France, etc., in which we see manifested the crisis of solidarity and the growth of individualism. This, paradoxically, represents a rollback of the social achievements that the European Union was put in place to protect. In Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father Francis tells us, and I quote, we can no longer trust in the unseen forces and the invisible hand of the market. I used to comment, the invisible hand became a thief hand. And this has been most of the problems of the economy in modern times. Growth in justice requires more than economic growth while presupposing such growth. It requires decisions, programs, mechanisms, and processes, specially geared to a better distribution of income. The creation of sources of employment and an integral promotion of the poor, which goes beyond a simple welfare mentality. This is very important to understand his way of thinking. It's not only a, a very good feeling of him. It's one of the centers of his message. We have to consider that the lack of solidarity affects the whole world. Globalization has demonstrated that it is impossible to deny that we all depend on one another. We are family, no matter what. Whenever we are, 
a healthy or dysfunctional family is another matter. Pope Francis has summarized this in several instances. For example, on the occasion of the visit to the Food of and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, he stated, when there is a lack of solidarity in a country, the effects are felt by all. We are witnessing this, for example, in the Syrian conflict, with the interventions of mayor world powers or in the conflicts over building walls in several countries, which touched some of the most sensitive contemporary issues. International terrorism, demographic crisis, the growth of organized crime. Thus, globalization requires the creation of supranational entities to resolve conflicts on the basis of international solidarity and no other interest. Bilateral or tripartite agreements are no longer sufficient. Such is the nature of interrelationship. No one can be excluded because interdependence is everything. And these institutions are not enough. It's been clear demonstrated by the recent events. It is necessary to promote environments of citizen solidarity. The reality is that solidarity is a matter for everyone, and it depends on everyone. If a single person wants to do harm, they can do tremendous damage. We see this clearly on display in suicide bombings. Just as no brother can be left homeless, no one can be left out of his or her obligation to be in solidarity. This perspective should not be understood as negative. On the contrary, even human beings is important in the building of a better world. Everyone has a role to play in God's plan for creation. This truth is key for ensuring the development of the world, and it can only come from absolute truth, from God, God's self. Important goal, uh, gospel passages remind us of this. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. Also, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicate you. So, international solidarity is a fundamental principle in human development. The solution to the main problems of the world cannot do away with solidarity understood from Christian principles based on the building of a fraternal society. The construction of the structure of the modern state is based on solidarity. It is the root of the rule of law and of the welfare state. Governments and institutions must act solidaristically to create supranational structures to solve global problems. These structures must work in an efficient way and with the delegation of sovereignty. Unfortunately, many of these institutions are controlled by the most powerful countries and do not have sufficient independence or comprehensive plans of action. Additionally, governments, institutions, and supernatural or supranational organizations must understand that they cannot completely solve 
the world's problems by themselves, not, nor in many cases can they take the initiative. Solidarity makes the world react in the face of wars, natural disasters, attacks, etc. When governments and institutions are most fragile, the human being demonstrates his or her capacity to grow and overcome through solidarity. The principle of subsidiarity of the social doctrine of the church is intimately connected to the principle of solidarity and must always be respected. Otherwise, by denying or limiting the autonomy of citizens, families, parishes, social movements, etc., the state institution and supranational organizations assume responsibilities that they cannot actually carry out. Thus arise situations of helplessness from which originate of many of the injustices and problems of the world today. Thus, governments must understand that in addition to fostering solidarity among themselves, it is just as important and thus deserving of the same level of economic support and publicity to protect and promote the exercise of solidarity among individuals, families, and civil society as an essential part of the dynamic of human progress. In the encyclical letter Laudato Si, and permit me to recommend all of those of you who didn't read it yet to tell you that you are two years in retard. <laughs> it's necessary because many people are criticizing Laudato Si without knowing it, as they do with Amoris Letizia when they only are concentrated in chapter 8 and a footnote. The letter is beautiful, and it's a, a strong way of the future for pastoral of families. And so, Laudato Si, in that letter, Pope Francis tells us, politics must not be subjected to the economy, nor should the economy be subjected to the dictates of an efficiency-driven paradigm of technology. Today, in view of the common good, there is urgent need for politics and economics to enter into a frank dialogue in the service of life, especially human life. In many, in many forums, we have discussed about Laudato Si, and many people who only concentrate in one or two themes and do not read the whole document, they used to argue, okay, but what is the Pope proposing? He is not an economist. He is not an ecologist. He is, stop. You have to read the global aspect of the encyclical letter, which is not on only global warming. The encyclical letter is about what St. Francis was telling us and recommending us to take care of the creation, to take care of the creation. So it's not a technical uh, document over global warming. And what is the Pope proposing? The only solution, which is called dialogue. And without the last chapter, we would not understand Laudato Si. Dialogue in all the aspects of the care of our common home. And it's necessary, it's absolutely necessary to change our points of view and with dialogue try to go to the different instances. 
That is why solidarity at the level of the individual, family, and civil society, including, of course, the church, is called to make the world a better place. States or organizations occasionally take credit for the achievements initiated by solidarity at the individual, familial, or civil society level. And individual and family solidarity continues ahead of all of the institutions taking the initiative to propel the world and its governments to advance justice and peace. We cannot ignore the fundamental role that the church can play both as a seed of the conception of solidarity and as an expert in its development and practical implementation. The errors of the church, disagreements about criteria, or the secularism of states does not justify ceasing to collaborate with an institution that has demonstrated its great capacity to foster solidarity far ahead of any other religious faith. This is a fact beyond any political argument. There are numerous examples where the Catholic Church has acted, taken the initiative in the realm of solidarity. In the past, it took the initiative in the creation of hospitals, schools, universities. It inspired the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the origin of European Union, etc. In the present, the church advances vital work in aspects including social programs, training, and understanding in society. So, an education in solidarity is necessary. It's not only a good feeling of good people, it's necessary to educate in solidarity. There does not exist a rigorous formation in solidarity and the level of the state and society. True and effective solidarity is something that derives from a conception of humanity as brothers and sisters. And such a conception is only possible from the perspective of a God who created human beings in God's own image and likeness. The message of the gospel in the path of attaining true solidarity. Pope Francis summarizes it perfectly when he says, solidarity is born of the capacity to comprehend the needs of the brother and a sister in difficulty. Other conceptions of solidarity may be well-intentioned, but if they do not understand that the other is a brother or a sister, they contain errors that impede the effective creation of a just world. These, for example, is the cause of populist movement that are based more in class struggle and victiveness than in fraternity, rightly understood with rights and obligations. It is interesting what Pope Francis has to tell us on this subject in Evangelii Gaudium number 87. I quote, Today, when the networks and means of human communication have made unprecedented advances, we sense the challenge of finding and sharing a mystic of living together, of mingling and encounter, of embracing and supporting one another, of stepping into this flood tide which, while chaotic, can become a genuine experience of fraternity, a caravan of solidarity, a sacred pilgrimage. Greater possibilities for communication 
thus turn into greater possibilities of encounter and solidarity for everyone. If we were able to take this route, it would be so good, so soothing, so liberating and hope-filled. These words are very powerful for the future. So we need not only to be educated in solidarity, but we need to practice solidarity. Continuing with the preaching of Pope Francis, after understanding the needs of the brother or sister, we need to take care of them. This is the spirit of Laudato Si, to take care of the creation, to take care of the brother, to take care of the sisters, to take care of family, to take care of all the creation. The message of the gospel demands that it be put into practice to do so in works. We remember St. James, faith without works is dead. Faced with the structural scene in today's society where the throwaway culture, and all of the themes of Pope Francis, the throwaway culture, pervades. The culture of encounter is the only thing capable of building a more just and fraternal world, a better world. Many churches offer a message of solidarity, but this is not enough. The Catholic Church must make it a reality, incarnating it in a continual way, gratuitously, profoundly, in the earth's most forgotten places. The practice of solidarity urges us to attend to the vulnerable, to the helpless, from a vision of gratuitousness. No one can give what he or she does not possess. So we cannot ask countries, communities, etc., to be in solidarity if they have never experienced solidarity. In a world so concerned with economics, with give and take, do udes, this vision is almost impossible. We discover then the structural sin of the developed world that impedes the very solidarity that both undergirded its development and can save it from self-destruction. So, educating to solidarity, putting in practice solidarity, and now the church as the man in the agriculture that is planting seeds. It's necessary the church as seed of solidarity. And not only that, as a mother who protects international solidarity. The seed of true solidarity is in the Catholic Church as the body of Christ and living sacrament in all of the church's works of solidarity. From there, it extends out to the world as a mustard seed and has given rise to the greatest social achievements, hospitals, schools, colleges, normative codes, etc., that have formed the foundations of contemporary society. It is necessary to make states, institutions, and civil society, and the people themselves, aware that to forget this experience of and commitment to solidarity will be a serious mistake. To deny the roots of solidarity would mean preventing the growth of solidarity in society because social achievements are not static. The human being is in a state of continuous evolution and it's necessary to continually renew and reevaluate human development in light of the universal principles in which 
Solidarity is grounded. The human being, in his or her freedom, must continuously make decisions. If solidarity does not permeate all of one's life, one will become disoriented in the process of one's becoming, and new generations will grow up in the ignorance that eventually leads to self-destruction. We cannot renounce the example, protection, and guide that the Catholic Church offers the world as mother of international solidarity. But solidarity speaks for itself. Pope Francis is an example not only for this action in helping the poor, but also for the way he conducts his personal life. In his personal activities as bishop and archbishop of Buenos Aires, he demonstrated his humility and simplicity. He did not want to live in the Episcopal Palace, but rather chose to live in a simple apartment, a very small one, and cooking his own food. His own food. Uh, oftentimes, he used public transportation to visit the faithful, to visit the poor barriers and, and neighborhoods, in, in bus or in metro, among the people, the ordinary people. His humility helped the, for the poor and commitment to dialogue with persons of different backgrounds and faith are well known. As a priest, Pope Francis showed a variety of gestures that demonstrated simplicity. Once elected Pope, he decided to reside in Casa Santa Marta instead of the apartment in the Apostolic Palace used by his predecessors since 1903. And this was scandalizing some people. I said, oh, how come? Okay, he lives with dignity in a very small apartment where he feels at his own. He's not pretending to have who knows what kind of, of quarters, living quarters. Among the actions that have characterized his pontificate, those that stand out include his reform initiatives in areas as different as economics and finances, administration, ecclesiastical tribunals, and canon law, social communications, health, the laity, and the family. With this, he proposed solutions to complete issues such as transparency in Vatican finances, coherence between the mission of evangelization and economic activity, and simplification of bureaucracy. As Archbishop and Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio was also known for his doctrinal balance and his commitment to social justice. He was concerned with promoting dialogue and with closeness to different social groups, were Catholic or not. He was also concerned with strengthening pastoral work in parishes, increasing the presence of priests in the villas or slums. These made him know as the bishop of the poor. In his message, Pope Francis rejects work that subjects people to unjust or degradating working conditions, such as prostitution, human trafficking, or sweatshops, which he has called modern-day slavery. And he has said, quote, I pray for justice for these men and women subjected to human trafficking in any way, sweatshops, prostitution, children subjected to farm labor, and trash pickers who live on the crumbs that fall from the tables of the well-fed. Recently, he made several important decisions to help the poor of Rome. He established a dormitory, a medical service, 
a barber shop for those who live on the street. And recently he also opened a laundromat. Yes, it's necessary. Poor people have nothing. Somebody has to take care of them. He asked the bishop in charge of attending to the poor to walk around the streets at night, leaving the Vatican to feed the hungry. He speaks against excessive spending by the church. Pope Francis was aware of this. He did something that had never been done before, despite being a very reasonable decision. He auctioned off a card that he has been giving, along with other gifts, to benefit the homeland. This was very, very beautiful initiative, you know, because in Rome, these raffles are forbidden, but not in the Vatican. So he was promoting, <laughs> he was promoting a big raffle of many of the gifts he received usually that they go to a, to a depot where they are just growing dust. No, he just said, okay, we have to help the poor, so make this. It was like a joke, but people appreciate it very much. These are initiatives that comes naturally from him. From, and whenever he visits, you know, I was impressed. In the first visit, he paid to Assisi on October 4th of uh, 2014. Okay, no, 2013, yes. It was, it was his first visit, first visit to Assisi. Okay, there was in the, in the big dining room of the Franciscans, there was a big meal prepared for 500 visitors, but the Pope was not there. He chose to go to a very humble dining room with all the poor people of Assisi, and he does this very frequently. He does not take the meals with the bishops of the places he, he visits. He prefers to go to eat with the poor. It's not like, like propaganda. It, it comes naturally from him. And this is a sign, clear sign of solidarity with those who have less. It is important that politicians and wealthy Learn from the humility and solidarity with the poor that Pope Francis teaches by example. In Evangelii Gaudium, he tells us, and I quote, number 58, I exhort you to generous solidarity and to the return of economics and finance to an ethical approach which favors human beings. Ethical approach. Is not only good feeling, good heart, good moves occasionally. No, it's a permanent attitude. It's an ethical attitude of the people. In this way, we could have a more solidari solidaristic world, a world that cares about the well-being of the people, diminishing social inequality, avoiding many social conflicts. And so, getting ready for the final approach, I would say solidarity is not a discourse, but rather a fundamental option. A fundamental option. In the homily of Corpus Christi 2013, the Pope pointed out to us how to leave out solidarity from gospel passage, which for many people remains a miracle with a certain hint of magic, emphasizing that solidarity is in the capacity to change our attitude and to make our own the needs of others. And I quote, Where does the multiplication of the loaves come from? The answer lies in Jesus' request to the disciples, you give them to give, to share. What do these disciples share? 
the little they have, five loaves and two fish. However, it is those very loaves and fish in the Lord's hands that feed the entire crowd. And it is the disciples themselves, bewildered as they face the insufficiency of their means, the poverty of what they are, of what they were able to make available, who get the people to sit down, and who, trusting in Jesus' words, words, distribute the loaves and fish that satisfy the crowd. And this tells us that in the church, but also in society, a key word of which we must not be frightened is solidarity. That is, the ability to make what we have, our humble capacities, available to God for only in sharing, in giving, will our life be fruitful. Solidarity is a word seen badly by the spirit of the world. One essential theme for Pope Francis is the hunger that comes from extreme poverty, emphasizing that there is a culture of waste that also made us insensitive to wasting and throwing out excess foodstuffs, which is specifically condemnable when in every part of the world, unfortunately, many people and families suffer hunger and malnutrition. There was a time when our grandparents were very careful not to throw away any leftover food. Consumerism has induced us to be accustomed to excesses and to the daily waste of food, whose value, which goes far beyond mere financial parameters, we are no longer able to judge correctly. Every single word has a weight and, of course, is motivating the people to a part practical conversion to solidarity. In his memorable speech given before the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, the United Nations, he states, it is a well-known fact that current levels of production are sufficient, yet millions of people are still suffering and dying of starvation. These Dear friends, is truly scandalous. A way has to be found to enable everyone to benefit from the fruits of the earth and not simply to close the gap between the affluent and those who must be satisfied with the crumbs failing from the table, but about all to satisfy the demands of justice, fairness, and respect for every human being. This, he continues, this, I believe, is the significance of our meeting today, to share the idea that something more can and must be done in order to provide a new stimulus to international activity on behalf of the poor, inspired by something more than mere goodwill or worse, promises which all too often have not been kept. Nor can the current global crisis continue to be used as an alibi, a daily excuse. The crisis will not be completely over until situations and living conditions are examined in terms of the human person and human dignity. It is a willingness to share everything and to decide to be good Samaritans instead of people who are indifferent before the needs of others. Every proposal must involve everyone. This is another concept of the Pope, very frequent in his writings, you know. 
Nobody is excluded. Nobody of us can say, this doesn't touch me, because all of us are co-responsible. Another big idea of the social doctrine of the church. The Pope, and be happy I am approaching to the end. The Pope has emphasized that work dignifies the human person and is a responsibility of the different social and political actors and leaders, that there are opportunities extending to everyone. I quote, the invitation to solidarity, and I would like to encourage those in public office to make every effort to give a new impetus to employment. This means caring for the dignity of the person. The Pope does not ignore the global financial problems, of course, but rather links them to a necess necessary paradigm shift, knowing that the solution to these problems is in the change of vision of the primordial objective of the economy and finances in the world. In a speech to the ambassadors of Kyrgyzstan, Antigua and Barbuda, Luxembourg and Botswana, on May 16, 2013, he pointed out with great clarity that the worldwide financial and economical crisis seems to highlight their distortions and about all the gravely deficient human perspective which reduces man to one of his needs alone, namely consumption. Worse yet, human beings themselves are nowadays considered as consumer goods which can be used and thrown away. In circumstances like this, solidarity, which is the treasure of the poor, is often cons often considered counterproductive, opposed to the logic of finance and the economy. A new, invisible, and at all times virtual tyranny is established, one which unilaterally and irremediably imposes its own laws and rules. Moreover, indebtedness and credit distance, countries from the real economy and citizens from the real buying power. Added to this, as if it were needed, is widespread corruption and selfish fiscal evasion which have taken the worldwide dimensions. The will to power and of possession has become limitless. Concealed behind this attitude is a rejection of ethics, a rejection of God, Ethics, like solidarity, is a nuisance. In this sense, I encourage the financial experts and the political leaders of your countries to consider the words of St. John Chrysostom. Not to share one's goods with the poor is to rob them and to deprive them of life. It is not our goods that we possess, but theirs. There is a need for financial reform along ethical lines that would produce in its turn an economic reform to benefit everyone. In the same way, he holds all the world's governments responsible in a letter addressed to former British Prime Minister David Cameron on the occasion of the G8 meeting, Pope Francis said, the primary importance of putting humanity, every single man and woman, at the center of all political and economic activity, both nationally and internationally, because man is the truest and deepest resource for politics and economics, as well as their ultimate end. And I will end. I go to my conclusion. 
to understand Pope Francis' message of solidarity, we need to analyze it from solidarity itself. This means to feel in our flesh the most needy, to put ourselves in the shoes of those who are in the street with nothing to eat, without opportunities for development, of the desperate mothers who do not know what to do with an unwanted child, of the fathers who do not know if tomorrow they will have enough money to feed their children. This is what Pope Francis calls going to the margins of humanity, which calls us to involve ourselves personally and concretely in the solidaristic support of others. The preferential option for the poor to which the Pope has called us from the first days of his pontificate is not an ideological call for class struggle. It is the call of the gospel to see in every one of the most needy the face of Christ who being rich became poor and to act accordingly. Thank you very much.